There were three great trails in the Trans-Missourian West. The Oregon and Mormon trails were routes of human migration. Men, women, and children traveled to Oregon, California, or Utah in search of homes and a new start. The other trail was a trail of commerce and was used for 59 years. The Santa Fe Trail was much like a modern highway. Wagons loaded with freight left Missouri for the 900-mile journey to Santa Fe. The caravans might pass wagons traveling east loaded with silver, pelts, hide, and wool, or Mexican freighters headed to Missouri to purchase trade goods. Although many freighters ended their journey in Santa Fe, others continued their trek to settlements in Arizona, California, and Mexico. Dr. Raymond Powers of the Kansas State Historic Society comments on the significance of the Santa Fe Trail. The Santa Fe Trail was an important trail of commerce that extended from Missouri to uh, what was then uh, Mexico, the northern province of New Mexico, to Santa Fe. That trade or that connection existed from 1821 when William Becknell took some pack animals with supplies into Santa Fe and extended on to 1880 when the Santa Fe Railroad eventually made it all the way to Santa Fe, New Mexico. In the early years of the Santa Fe trade, uh, that trade was dominated by merchants uh, out of uh, New Mexico. Uh, the Santa Fe merchants, uh, Hispanics, uh, were the primary force in the early years of the trade. Uh, they were also very much interested in the cultural ties between the United States and uh, their particular and their province in Mexico. A uh, number of them sent their children to school in St. Louis. So in some ways, the facet of the Santa Fe Trail that we've overlooked in the past has been the importance of the Santa Fe merchants. After the, their influence in the Santa Fe trade diminished significantly with the Mexican War. After the war, an important part of the Santa Fe trade or travel down the tra uh, trail was the supplying of the military post in the southwest. After many days' travel, the caravans crossed Cow Creek in present-day Rice County and began looking for an important landmark, Plum Buttes. Approaching Plum Buttes, the wagons traveled in columns, leaving behind deep wagon ruts. These ruts can be seen on the farm of Ralph Hathaway, west of Chase. We are at uh, a place called Ralph's Ruts. Uh, this is an old family homestead. We have 40 acres that has never been plowed. Uh, there are Santa Fe Trail ruts through here, more or less uh, running pretty much westerly. Uh, since this was never plowed or cultivated, the ruts are still there. Had it been plowed, the ruts would be gone. Uh, this also was the scene of uh, an Indian a confrontation with a band of Indians. Uh, that happened along the east edge of this quarter section. It would be about, oh, roughly three-eighths of a mile east of where we're standing. A wagon train uh, belonging to a trader by the name of Franz Hooning or Hunning, H-U-N-I-N-G, was attacked here by a band of Indians. Uh, when uh, my grandfather was breaking sod along the east side of this quarter section, he discovered uh, evidence of this. He plowed up uh, hardware from wagons, some broken dishes, some mini balls, and this sort of thing. You see, they normally travel in four lines side by side, and the purpose of this was so that in the event of a, an emergency, they could get into their defensive position more quickly than if they were in single file. And here, probably, uh, the ruts became so deep the sand, the loose sand, and, and you can imagine after all those hooves, um, oxen hooves and the wagon wheels, uh, there probably was uh, deep sand, loose sand, that uh, would increase the rolling resistance. And probably from time to time, they simply moved over and started another rut. The area you see now was the site of the, plum, the, the landmark known as Plum Buttes. There were three big sand dunes. Uh, Mother Nature built them centuries ago as a lot of uh, sand was blown out of the Arkansas River Valley. 
deposited in this area. And in the process, it built three big sand dunes, which some historians say were as much as 80 feet high. They were there when the first travelers came through. And shortly after the trail closed, the wind began their destruction. Um, a phenomenal thing. Uh, their their uh, demise is as phenomenal as their origin. Uh, they were called plum buttes because there were plum bushes growing around the bases of these dunes, uh, the sandhill plum or wild plum, uh, very similar to the what's called the American plum. Uh, that would be the only woody plant you would find in this area in, in back in trail days. Uh, the one dune that, that you see, which uh, appears to be covered with uh, plum bushes, may be one of the original tall sand dunes. After leaving Cow Creek, traveling west, the next camp was in the Arkansas River Valley, a large stand of cottonwood trees called Pitt Grove, located on a 28-acre island in the river, was the attraction to camp on what is now the west edge of Ellenwood. The great flood of 1884 changed the river channel to the south bank, where there was another large stand of trees used by campers for fuel. Dr. Thomas Lester described this campsite in 1847. At four o'clock, we reached what is termed the bend in the Arkansas and find the river from one-fourth to one-half mile wide and about two feet average depth. Water very muddy. Uh, the soil here is very poor and sandy. Dr. Thomas B. Lester, 1847. Newspaper accounts of the trail note that the burial of most of those who died after crossing Cow Creek was intended to be made at the Walnut Crossing, but many were buried upon reaching the river here. Their bodies were coffinless, and the graves were often unmarked. Susan McGoffin recorded burials in her 1846 journal. The manner of interning on the plains is necessarily very simple. The grave is dug very deep to prevent the body from being found by the wolves. The corpse is rolled in a blanket, lowered, and stones put on it. The earth is then thrown in, the sod replaced, and it is well beaten down. Often the corral is made over it to make the earth still more firm by the tromping of the stock. The Mexicans always place a cross at the grave. Susan McGoffin, 1846. The Ellenwood newspapers tell of over 100 graves located on the high ground at the campsite. During the 1880s, high water washed many bones out of the north bank. The owner of the property, John Wolfe, said he saw many skulls and scalps washed out of the sand. John attributed the graves to travelers killed by Indians, but most died of disease. John also found remains of a building while planting fruit trees. This was the site of Clark's trading post burned down by Indians after serving the freighters for only a few years. After leaving the campsite at the bend of the Arkansas, travelers moved west toward Walnut Creek. Dr. Lester noted, The next morning, August 3rd, we marched 10 miles. In six miles, we came to Walnut Creek. A short distance, we discovered a large herd of buffalo. One of our teamsters went in pursuit. Dr. Thomas B. Lester, 1847. Dr. Lester's party had no problems crossing the Walnut Creek. Others were not so fortunate. Matt Fields' 1850 party waited four days for the water to recede. Anna Marie Morris noted in her diary, This is a lost day to us. It is impossible to cross the creek. I took a ride on horseback this morning, and I intend to ride every day, as our horse is easy and gentle. The adjutant sent me half a loaf of bread today, and it was quite a treat. The woman who cooks for him came over with her yeast and made me up a loaf for tomorrow. She says I look so much better than when we left Leavenworth that I ought to stay on the prairie all the time. The woman came from Santa Fe with Mrs. Henry and understands camp life. A soldier, Private Fisher, was drowned this afternoon. Anna Maria Morris, 1850. When Anna Marie Morris camped at the Walnut Creek, there were no buildings. But over the next few years, a small community developed. In 1867, Edo Hunnis sketched the early buildings on an envelope. Local historian Ray Schultz describes the early buildings at the Walnut Creek site. This is in the general area of the Walnut Crossing on the Santa Fe Trail, which was quite a famous place. Everyone knew it, sometimes by different names. It was either Allison's Fort or Allison's Ranch or Allison Booth Ranch or the Peacock Trading Post or the Rath Trading Post or Fort Zara. 
Uh, it, at any rate, it was a crossing of the Santa Fe Trail on, a, on the Walnut Creek. <clears throat> the trading post that was here had a several uh, owners and uh, operators at various times. The original one came uh, with Allison, William Allison, who was a former mail conductor, and his partner was Francis Booth, who also was a former mail conductor to Santa Fe. And they loaded two wagons of trade goods and started to the mountains to sell their trade goods, and they got as far as this point, and their mules gave out, so they built a building and uh, made a trading post which was really one of the first ones between Council Grove and Bent's Fort. Later on, within 10 years, there was one about every camp place all the way from Council Grove to Bent's Fort because theirs had been so successful. The archaeological evidence supports the historical record. Bob Button, representing the Apache chapter of the Kansas Anthropological Association, describes the excavation of the trading post. In, in 1969, when we excavated the Allison Peacock Trading Post. According to uh, all information, it was supposedly something like a hundred foot long, divided into about two or three rooms. The south room, which was probably used as a trading area, was was quite barren of any large amount of artifacts. A lot of uh, trade beads and things like this were found. This also had, uh, all that was left was the foundation walls, which were huge uh, sandstone blocks that had been hewn from the rock quarry probably to the northeast of there several miles. In the north room, it was, was probably the living quarters. They were found a lot of uh, piece of glassware, dishes, and things of this sort. Uh, burnt parts of guns, approximately seven guns, I think it was, that were finally identified, different pieces that were left. On the floor had, was a uh, thin skim of um, charcoal. And by tracing this out, they evidently had a canvas on the floor and randomly uh, square nails were driven down through it to keep the canvas from scooting around on the floor. Then around the edges of the wall we would find the brass eyelets from this old canvas. Then in May 19th, 1868, the trading post was burned to ground by a party of Cheyenne and Arapaho Indians. And according to the story, Douglas escaped with just his horse and his life. In late 1863, the U.S. Army established Camp Dunlap, where living conditions were primitive. Lieutenant Bell, while escorting a mail coach, reported, Their quarters was a little dugout in the side of a hill along the riverbank. They had a gunny sack for a door, and I went into the first room, which was used for a kitchen, and the cook told me to go to the next room. It had a gunny sack door, too. The first and second lieutenant were in the other room. Lieutenant Bell, 1864. A more permanent post was established in June of 1864 and named Fort Zara. They came up here and built a, a 90 foot by 60 foot fort with towers at uh, opposite corners. It was located right in here. Part of it was in this burrow ditch along the new highway here. And part of it extended out here in this field. It had a ditch at or I, rather it had a cellar at each end of the of the building about 15 feet wide. In one of the cellars there was a water well so that they could wouldn't have to come out for water. Uh, it housed uh, maybe a, as many as 120 men at one time. It was built here in 1867 and abandoned and dismantled in 1869. The time that this fort sat here it was used primarily for escorts on the mail and the wagon trains uh, in both directions. And as a matter of fact, most of the uh, animals and horses and mounts were worn out escorting the mail. And uh, it was very difficult to keep uh, enough men and horses at this area. In 1861, Charles Rath constructed a toll bridge over the Walnut Creek 
ending the long delays and difficult crossings. Corporate records indicate the Walnut Bridge Company to be the first corporation in the new state of Kansas. Unfortunately, none of the buildings have survived into the 20th century. One must visualize the site as it was in 1867. The Allison Peacock Trading Post was located on the north bank of the Walnut Creek. Just west of the trading post was located the first group of military buildings and the toll bridge. The later stone fort was located north adjacent to the modern highway. The years 1862 to 1869 were traumatic years with an increase in Indian conflicts. Ray Schultz describes an incident known as the Walnut Creek Massacre. Photographs provided by Bob Button verify the historical accounts. In 1864, there was a wagon train massacre that occurred here, and 10 people were killed, 10 Teamsters, and uh, eight of them were, were uh, scalped, and uh, two uh, uh, black men were not scalped but were killed. They were, their graves were discovered in April of eight, 1972, and they were right over here on the creek bank. The high water in the creek had washed out some of the bones and they were discovered that way. Popular literature dramatized Indian attacks. However, travelers were more likely to die of disease and accidents. Charles Gentry describes the result of a serious accident. Andrew Broadus, a Missouri freighter formerly from Madison County, Kentucky, had his first sight of a buffalo, became excited, and in attempting to draw his rifle muzzle in first from the wagon, discharged its contents into his right arm. The wound was a terrible one, and the weather was very hot. He proceeded with the caravan for several days, but at Walnut Creek, gangrene had set in, and it was evident to all that if the arm was not cut off, he would lose his life. Broadus was a man of nerve and bravery, and realizing his condition, and that there was no surgeon along, called for his old Kentucky friend, Colonel Richard Gentry, and asked him to cut off his arm. After many expostulations, believing it was too late and that such a crude operation would only hasten his death, Colonel Gentry finally consented. His only surgical instruments were his own razor, a handsaw, and a coupling pin. Charles Gentry, 1826. After crossing the Walnut Creek, travelers encountered miles of dry, featureless plain. Eastern-born travelers were often dismayed by the lack of rain and reliable sources of water. As late as 1881, photographs show no trees along the bank of the Arkansas River. Louis Girard describes the land west of the Walnut Creek crossing. The grass in this region is short, early, and highly nutritious. It has a withered brown appearance, even in the early spring, and is designated as buffalo grass from the fact that it grows in the present buffalo range and forms their principal food. Louis Girard, 1826. Travelers began to anxiously search for the next landmark, Pawnee Rock. Modern travelers should note much of the original formation has been destroyed over the years. In the summer of 1872, this stretch of the Santa Fe Trail became obsolete with the construction of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad. However, the old freight trail was not forgotten. Today, travelers can follow the route by the DAR markers placed in 1911. In 1987, the Santa Fe Trail was designated a National Historic Trail. Today, freight still travels the same route as the long caravans once did, passing historic markers and landmarks. Dr. Raymond Powers. It's very important that we preserve trail ruts, that we preserve these various sites along the trail, and that we provide interpretive centers where we tell the story of the trail for a couple of reasons. One is certainly just to be able to continually uh, tell of the human drama that is part of the past. Tell of that, of those heroic stories and, and those not so heroic stories at times. But the other aspect of it is simply to have these pieces of the trail preserved as part of the landscape of our minds so that the past isn't just a kind of uh, memory from book, uh, memory from manuscript but it is, in fact, tangible to us in some way. And that's really why we need to keep tangible parts of our past there, because they reinforce the idea that we are a people of memory, that it is our memory and our sense of the past that makes us what we are as human beings. And I feel that it is extraordinarily important that not only that we keep that memory through the documentation, the books and the stories and all of that, 
but we also have to keep tangible reminders of that story. And that's why we also need to keep places like Fort Leonard, Ruts on the Trail, because they are what we have left, tangible reflections of that memory. Hearty souls in days when westward expansion meant weeks of hardship, danger, and sacrifice. Miles of choking dust across endless monotonous prairie, where the threat of Indian attacks called for constant vigil and courage beyond all human endurance. Where water was scarce, and its remote sources bore easily remembered names. Lone Elm Campground, Wagon Bed Spring, Middle Spring, and the beautiful camp on the Arkansas, where buffalo roamed freely, providing meat and clothing for Indians and trail travelers alike. Life on the Santa Fe Trail was a hard, self-sacrificing existence at best. At the trailhead was the powerful, unpredictable Missouri River. At trail's end, Mexico's North American jewel, Santa Fe, where riches and wealth awaited those who completed the treacherous journey. The memories of those who did not make it are etched in crumbling gravestones, their ultimate sacrifices all but forgotten. The Santa Fe Trail snaked its way a thousand miles through middle America, yet scarcely more than half a century through history. And all along the trail's route from Missouri to New Mexico, are the ruts and swales left by thousands of wagons, teams of oxen, mules, horses, and people. Reminders that achieving the American dream takes courage, sacrifice, and hard work. Its ghosts still haunt modern day travelers with names forever etched in the chronicles of America's westward movement. Names steeped in history and legend. Christopher Kit Carson, Jim Bridger, George Armstrong Custer, Buffalo Bill Cody, Alexander Majors, and William Bent. Though portions of the Santa Fe Trail route had generally been followed by explorers and traders since the 1500s, it was Missouri merchant William Becknell who first opened the Santa Fe Trail as a major trade route in 1822. Since much of the American Southwest was still part of Mexico, 
Becknell recognized the opportunity to make a lot of money by transporting and trading American goods with the Mexicans in Santa Fe. The Santa Fe Trail was the first trade route of the great westward expansion and the only trail that began in the United States and ended in a foreign country, Mexico. It was a survivor of some of the most violent and tumultuous years in American history. Today, trail buffs take a somewhat romantic view of this great American pathway, but in its heyday, it was anything but romantic. It was a mass of covered wagons, stagecoaches, animals, and often confused and sometimes terrified humanity. In the early days, the Santa Fe Trail began at Franklin, Missouri, just over a hundred miles east of Kansas City. It's a quiet, friendly community, proud of its heritage, although it was not the original Santa Fe Trail head. The trail originally began at a town now referred to as Old Franklin that was wiped out in a Missouri River flood in 1828. This monument is located about 500 feet from the spot where the town's newspaper, the Missouri Intelligencer and Boone's Lake Advertiser once stood. The present community was then established about two miles from the Missouri River, and although it is more than 160 years old, it is still called New Franklin. The Missouri River became a prominent transportation link with the Santa Fe Trail, and through the mid-1800s, this valley was often barely visible through the smoky haze from dozens of steamboats ferrying trade goods and pioneer families from other parts of the country. In later years, Captain Joseph Kinney's steamboats tied up close to his stately mansion, River Scene, near the site of Old Franklin. Kinney built the home in 1869. One of his descendants still lives here. A paved road now covers the trail where young Kit Carson took his last glimpse of his boyhood home at Old Franklin as his Santa Fe bound wagon train headed west along the Missouri River. Nicholas Amick probably paused a few moments in the labors of building his home and farm to watch as the long string of wagons passed by. The caravans headed into a section of wooded hills and farms known as the Boone's Lick Country. It was here in 1806 that Daniel Boone's two sons, Nathaniel and Daniel Morgan Boone, started a small company that extracted salt from a saline spring. It was located on a privately owned farm. The Boones sold out about five years later to their partners, James and Jesse Morrison. Bubbles are still popping to the surface of this little spring, which once produced as much as 100 bushels of salt a day. A rusty iron kettle used in the salt extraction process lies nearby. Boone's Lick was one of the things that attracted settlers to this area, but it was abandoned in 1833. A ferry near the Lick took Santa Fe bound travelers across the Missouri River to a town which has changed little over the years, Arrow Rock. The Houston Tavern, which was built in 1834, helps add to the town's history but it's the old stone gutters that give Arrow Rock its uniqueness and charm. The town's old stone jail, which could not have provided a very pleasant stay, its main street and many of the stately homes lining both sides of the thoroughfare saw the Santa Fe Trail grow from one man's idea into a major trading route from which many people prospered. Arrow Rock provided a much needed rest stop for Santa Fe Trail traders who watered their stock at a nearby spring. The wagons continued westward into the town of Lexington, Missouri, where today the Madonna of the Trail statue honors the women and children who joined their menfolk on a harrowing journey to a new land. Lexington was founded in 1822, just before the first wagons rolled through here en route to Santa Fe. But by September of 1861, it was only part of the trail's history. That's when a bloody battle broke out between Confederate and Union troops just outside town during the first year of the Civil War. The small and scarcely remembered fight lasted three days and ended in a Confederate victory. Graves of unknown soldiers.